Welcome to another session. Uh, I hope you are well. Uh, as always, it's good to have you uh, join me again. Um, today I'm going to be speaking about a topic that I have called the challenge in finding a high quality mate. A challenge uh, in finding a high quality uh, mate. Uh, I'm going to draw on, uh, I would say, a, a subject area that I I do not speak about regularly, but I think it's very, very uh, important for life, for business, for relationships, and um, where so many lessons can be learned. And that is the area of sales. Sales. Um, for many people, uh, sales is seen perhaps as a, as a profession that is chosen by those who are unable to fit into uh, the structured career paths or or jobs that most people generally go for. Uh, it's not unusual to find um, that when you say I'm a salesman or I'm a salesperson, most people t tend to think, wrongly in my opinion, that perhaps um, there were no other professions that you qualified for and therefore you chose to be a salesperson as a result of your inability uh, perhaps sometimes lack of education or training, lack of knowledge uh, in choosing a different field. In any case, those who are salespeople and those who are master salespeople always fall within the most highest paid across the whole world, irrespective of your geography. If you are a good salesperson, you can influence, you can be a good leader, and therefore you can actually get compensated very well. Think about any business you have. Think about any great inventor, great investor. Think about any great, even a, a social entrepreneur. Each and every one of them is exceptionally good at selling. Now let that, let that statement just uh, process for a few seconds. It doesn't matter whether you go into science, engineering, technology, math, or whether you go into the humanities or the arts, or whether you go into perhaps other parts of life such as um, uh, uh, philanthropy, whether you go into places such as, let's say, um, charity work. The best people in any field are those who can sell, who can present an idea, uh, those who understand the market, the target market, those who know how to pitch, those who know how to handle rejection, those who know how to fail and keep moving, like uh, Winston Churchill said once, should you find yourself in hell, don't stop, keep moving. Those who succeed in any area of life have to be good salespeople. Some people are trained to be great salespeople, and some people learn, you might say, by trial and error. But in any case, the consistency principle applies. To do well, you have to be able to overcome a, a few steps and stages in any area of life. The first is always obscurity. People do not know you. Therefore, you have to get attention. You have to attract people's attention. When you get their attention, then you have to pitch. When you've pitched, sometimes they will say no. So you have to learn how to handle rejection and keep trying. And if you do that, long enough and you keep modifying and improving your pitch and you keep learning about your target market, eventually a time will come where you have a, what we call the sweet spot. The product you're trying to sell, you find the exact market for that product, product is designed for. And when you bring together uh, a combination of two things, an awareness of what the client wants or the customer wants and sincerity, and your willingness to give them and help them achieve their goals and dreams. Um, Zig Ziglar, one of the greatest salespeople back in the day, said something that I, I've always remembered. He said, if you help enough people get what they want, you can have anything you want. And that is sales in its, in its general, ge generality. Today's session, I'm going to take everything I've shared so far, and I'm going to bring it into the area of uh, intersexual dynamics or relationships. Uh, 
I started by saying that my topic for today is um, whether we become passive in the ability to attract and find a high quality mate. I'm going to speak to the ladies, but before I do so, let me preface the male side so uh, it's easy to understand that this is no criticism per se um, to us the ladies and this is not I'm not trying to uh, praise the men per se human beings have two parts of their natures put this put it that way what we call a nurture or nature aspect to who we are biology and environment um, every one of us is influenced motivated um, driven by a part biology and part environment, nature and nurture. Men, for many years, and especially, uh, and you see this more so in parts that are outside of the developed West, there is a narrative from a social perspective that we have been conditioned to, uh, to accept as a, as a script. That role is the provider-protector role. The one who goes out and dies to protect those he loves and cares about. For that reason, men, generally speaking, in the sexual dynamics environment, when it comes to intersexual relations, we are the ones who make an effort to sell, to pitch. Um, we are the ones who are expected to go out there and handle rejection verbal rejection first and then maybe physical rejection and even intimacy rejection on our proposal for intimacy when we meet someone we find attractive that's part of the social uh, narrative um, women on the other hand are recipients so women play a different game a woman's game is one where she's supposed to resist um, a man's game is one where we're supposed to persist a man's game is also one where we pursue we pursue the lady and um, a woman's game is actually to make it hard uh, not by choice always but from a biological perspective that uh, she wants to consolidate on the, on, the, on the rarest and the most valuable person that she can find um, from a pure biological perspective um, and so you have this dance that men and women play however from a societal perspective an environmental perspective from a young age the guy is told you have to bring flowers, he's told you have to learn poetry, how to be humorous, he's told you have to know the right words, know what she likes, he's told you even have to know what her mother will tolerate because you, you have to show up at the mother's house. He's also told you have to pay for the first date, second date, third date, until she's willing to accept your advances and there's intimacy. In many ways, men have, to, have been conditioned to believe they have to be great salespeople. Now, we don't always do this correctly, but it's written into the script that we have to go out there and sell. So a man walks up to a woman in a supermarket and he risks rejection, public rejection, and sometimes humiliation. But he goes nonetheless. Why? Because he wants intimacy or he likes what he sees. Women, on the other hand, simply have to wait and exercise the option to accept or reject. So it's almost a passive role. Therefore, men have always played an active role in finding a high quality mate. And as part of that process, men recalibrate what we believe, um, I wouldn't use the word deserve, what we believe is fair exchange. So we rank ourselves into a hierarchy and to the highest person, we accept that person is the one who gets to be the, the king and therefore entitled to the queen, and then we come all the way down to the bottom. Men understand that hierarchy amongst men. But we are conditioned to be salespeople. Women, on the other hand, unfortunately, have not embraced what I consider to be um, the masculine roles that men always play. For example, in the West, there is this emphasis that men have to become more feminine. So we want men playing the provider protector role, but we also want men now playing the nurturing role. So we're expecting men to uh, feel and think like women, but also be like men. We haven't actually asked women to do the same. We've said to women, you can go and achieve, so you can play the 
provide a role. We don't necessarily say to women, you provide a protector role, but we certainly do not encourage women to take the lead or the initiative with, with regards to the early stages of a relationship. The selling, the pitching, the rejection uh, that comes with that lead process. So what you tend to find is um, this imbalance. This imbalance, unfortunately, is hurting women more than it is hurting men. And the reason is, um, is it's multifaceted. It's not just for one particular core area. It, it varies. In any case, let me get to what, what I'm trying to say. In order to find a quality mate, whether you are a man or a woman, the process is not a difficult process. It usually begins with, first of all, identifying what you want. It's really simple. What do you want? Now, once you've identified what you want, you began from the end in mind. Decide what life you want to live and work backwards to where you are. Now, understand that you have to pair bond with someone in order for that reality to be made real. And that means you also have to ask an important question, perhaps an equally important question. What would the person who I pair bond with, who can give me or who can meet me at my place of need? What do they also want? Once you've identified that, that's where the whole role of a salesperson begins. It means you then have to sell yourself. And I think fundamentally in the West, particularly in Britain, we haven't trained women how to sell themselves. Uh, in sessions that I have done uh, over the prior months and years, a question that I usually ask is, what is the value exchange? What is the value proposition? What do you bring to the negotiating table? What are you offering? And here's a sad reality. Most women, if you were to, uh, uh, I would use the word, uh, adjust for a number of variables, in other words, place those variables as constants or eliminate those variables completely. Women do not know what they bring to the table. Other than sex, eliminate sex. And ask a woman, what do you bring and what would you be offering to the man of your dreams? Other than sex, you find actually some women start to beatbox. They start to uh, babble. They're not very, very sure about why the question is being asked. And that's primarily because to be a good salesperson, you gone, should have gone through a process of, first of all, trying to sell yourself. First, you go through a process of pitching the product you have or the services you provide, you will provide. And then you have to deal with any rejection that comes from the first and the second. In other words, if I were to meet you as a salesperson, um, I have to sell myself first. So usually salespeople were, were the ones who were often one of the best dressed people. Why? Because image matters. People saw you first and they formed an opinion of you within a few seconds first before they got to listen to what product you had. But between listening to the product and its benefits and seeing you, there was something that actually took place. I call that the A, B, C, D, E, F up until G of self-image your appearance and your attitude, your behavior and your beauty if you are a lady, your communication style and your candle, how disciplined you are and your digital avatar, um, your E, emotional intelligence and effectiveness if you're a salesperson, F, friendliness, femininity, um, G, maybe your gratitude, your sense of grace and and peace, what comes with you, age, honesty, um, I, in inspiring, inspiration, integrity, insight, all of these things, and I, keep, I can go on until I get to Z, all of these things come first, before the product. First thing people listen to is what, what does he look like? What does she look like? So they see you first. People judge based on what they see first. And then they listen. And if there's congruency between what they've seen, what is being said, they then move to the next stage, which is the product. The question then is, does the product meet their needs? 
Now we understand this whole concept in sales. When we talk about men, men understand this concept when it comes to women. If I were to line up 10 men from across the UK, irrespective of, uh, let's say, location, but within the age demographics of 18 years to 55, I can say with some level of certainty and conviction that those men in that age range understand, number one, to attract a high quality woman, they have to sell themselves. Number two, they have to pitch themselves. In other words, go to a, a series of women um, over months and years, and they try to pitch themselves. They then have to, once they've actually pitched, they have to handle rejection. 10 men, 100 women. Each man pitches to 10 women each. He presents himself, firstly, by how he dresses, how he, he approaches the lady, his decorum. He introduces himself. That's pitching yourself. He talks about who he is. He talks about what he's doing. Sometimes we also include our vision of the future, our goals, and what we're hoping to achieve, our aspirations. That's part of pitching ourselves or selling ourselves. Then we pitch a proposal. Sometimes it's very, very overt. Sometimes it's covert. Uh, it could be wanting to take you out for a, a meal, wanting to ask you out uh, directly, wanting to see you again, or inquiring on ways that we might meet you for a second time without being too forward. For example, asking, do you train in this particular uh, stadium every single weekend? We're pitching. Now, we don't have to deal with the most important part. We've, we've sold ourselves, we've pitched, then there comes the rejection or the acceptance. We have to deal with, and prior to the swipe left and swipe right, that was how things were done. You got the feedback immediately. Sometimes people would say, well, you seem like a nice person, but I'm not interested. Or you seem like a great person. I'm seeing someone else. Or I don't find you attractive. Or you're not my type. Or, well, I don't like how you dress. I don't like how you speak. I don't even like your political affiliations or your, your, your philosophy about several things. That was rejection. The key part of it was a man had to know how to handle rejection. You have to know how to handle rejection as a man. Because the, the first, remember what I said with men, pursue and persist. That was the, uh, the, the, the you might call it the, the blueprint. A woman said no, and in between no and may, and yes was maybe. So when you walked up to her and you said, well, can I have your number? No. Okay. And then you spoke for a few more minutes. And maybe there was a common interest. And suddenly you were goofy initially and suddenly you made her laugh. And then you said, well, perhaps I can't call you directly. Um, you come here regularly. Perhaps if you'll be here next Saturday, I'll be happy to buy you a drink. And she says, well, maybe. That's rejection. You're handling rejection. And who knows, maybe next week you arrive and you meet again. And this time around, rather than ask for her number directly, you say, well, I'd like to leave my number with you. And if you feel comfortable, by all means, reach out. And she says, maybe I'll call you. Maybe I won't. And you go back to the same place the following weekend, hoping to see her again because she hasn't called. That is handling rejection. Dealing with the objections. Sometimes dealing with the complaints. Now, when we get past the rejection and, and, and complaints phase, we get into a stage where maybe there is a relationship. A conversation has gone beyond just uh, the initial interaction. It's, it's gone slightly uh, way deeper. That's when you start going from the attraction stage to the retention stage. A very simple concept with men. A line of 10 men, they understand that concept. If I were to line up 10 women on the other hand, as a matter of fact, most women listening to this would be thinking, but why should women approach men? Why should they have to do that? And this goes to the whole thing about wanting to be called equals, but not wanting to share uh, the equality of rejection or the equality of sales and marketing yourself and bringing something to the table other than sex and being interested enough. Most women in the West particularly are very passive when it comes to finding a high quality mate. Because there's a sense of entitlement that some of these women have 
where they have been you know, conditioned to believe that a, a woman doesn't have to do anything to attract a man. That all she has to do is decide when she is ready, like you walk into a supermarket and you can just choose the quality and the caliber of man that she wants. And this is why, fundamentally, women are failing. Failing significantly. Most have also been informed that to prioritize your education and your accomplishments, and that would be what you bring to the table other than sex. And what they are finding is the hypogamy. Is a, it exists. Even isogamy exists. Women tend to date across social economic hierarchies or upwards. Isogamy is where you date someone on the same level as you do, you are, and hypogamy is when you date someone above you. So women, generally speaking, the more educated they are, the more they're looking for someone who matches their level of education or intelligence or greater. <laughs> this even makes it much harder. Why? Because to find a high quality mate, you have to understand who they are. You have to understand their needs. You have to present yourself to them, pitch the idea. You might be rejected, but then you have to do the same thing that men do, which is pursue and persist. Women have not been trained to do that. So what you tend to find is most women, especially in their 20s and in 30s, are woefully unsuccessful in their relationships. Now, let me make a statement that I think is important. I do not consider dating to be a sign of success. Let me say that very slowly. In my books and in my in my world. Uh, dating is not a sign of success. I do not consider dating to be a sign of success. In a, in a colloquial meaning, dating simply means you're having sex with someone. <clears throat> success is when there's been a commitment of significant value offered and accepted. The value there is the key thing. Anybody can make an offer, but not all offers are valuable. So the offer has to be made from a valuable person, should have a value substance, and should be accepted. And that offer could be, could come in various ways. Marriage is the right way of keeping scores. Right. In the session to follow this one, I'm going to talk about unmarried, married, divorced, and um, widowed. And how there are only four stages. Unmarried, married, divorced, or widowed. If you are unmarried, which is what most people tend to begin their life with, unmarried, then it means until you have chosen. Now, you might choose by free will that you do not want to be in a relationship or be married, and that's a choice. Uh, I have nothing to say to that, but uh, I would also say that the women who present that position, in many ways, I, I understand that position, and if I was speaking to men in this in this uh, Western world, I would say, well, why buy a cow when you can have the milk for free? So women who are offering to take marriage out of the table, it's important women understand that you're not doing that uh, to your advantage per se. From a societal perspective, uh, from a legal perspective, the benefits of marriage to men uh, are almost close to zero, other than kids. If you, if you adjust for not having children, there is no benefit. So uh, it's important you understand how I keep score. Now, what this simply means, going back to today's session, is if you are unmarried, but you want a high quality mate as a woman, you have to know what men want. You have to be willing to uh, understand the value exchange. You have to understand where those men could be, proximity-wise. You have to get in proximity then you have to compete. Now the competition aspect is about selling yourself, pitching, and then going through the process of handling rejection. And when you handle rejection, knowing how to, uh, like people who learn sales, how to use a rejection to solicit more information to your advantage, but also more information to enable you to know how you can meet the person's needs. And then once that is, one that, once that has taken place, you go into a process of securing a client or a mate, and then the most important part, retention. So let me close today's session by simply saying as follows. Um, success is a numbers game. 
Success is a numbers game. And you can keep score from a relationship perspective by looking at the numbers. The younger you are, the more it's important to understand that if you are a woman, you have to start applying some of, some of the, I won't use the word masculine, but some of the masculine roles, um, especially if you are being raised to be a modern woman. The masculine roles include the art of sales and selling yourself, the art of accepting that you will have to pitch yourself and the art of handling uh, rejection. You have to accept that. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it. The, the, the gone are the days, and, and I think this is a sad thing, um, gone are the days when a woman could sit back and do nothing and men will be the ones who play the chivalrous role and present all offers to women. Those days are gone. Women, women wanted this. The, the sexual marketplace was deregulated. It was decentralized. Um, the swipe left, swipe right is here to stay. The porn industry is here to stay. Um, the, the, the attack on masculinity, so much so that men are not even trying, is here to stay. Therefore, to succeed as a woman, especially in your 20s, you have to understand how to uh, move from the passive approach to the active approach of finding a high quality mate. I'll say this and I close. Uh, my observation has been, in the 20s, women are empowered uh, through association to believe that the 20s is too young and they should enjoy themselves, embrace life, do everything possible and not worry about men because that is for the 30s. And once they are ready, they will find a quality mate. Women freeze in their minds. They almost freeze their sexual marketplace, which is usually based on how they see themselves at age 22, 23. Um, and they keep that number. And as they journey through their 20s and go into their 30s, they still think and believe that they are still the young girl who is 22 and 21. From 30 onwards, the women in question start to realize that, well, there aren't that many suitors. The number of suitors have been declining across time. And at roughly about 30, 35, you see a panic. Uh, you can almost smell the stench. Um, it's almost as though a desperation, a sense of desperation where women are now trying very hard to secure the highest quality mate that they can. But here's the key thing. Unfortunately, there's been no practice. There's been no interest in men. They don't understand men, generally speaking. Other than foreplay, there's been no play with a man. So they don't understand our psyche. What makes us think? Uh, what makes us happy? What makes us sad? What we want? As a matter of fact, we are attacked for our preferences. Um, whatever standards we have, those standards are seen to be reprehensible. If those standards do not meet uh, the woman's, uh, I'd say the woman's code. So at 35, women have spent a decade and more, they've burned most of their beauty in their youth, um, pursuing, I would say, goals that are not consistent with their long-term happiness and success. And at that late stage, you tend to find decisions being made um, based on a time limit. And therefore, those decisions are never great. And the men that are chosen are men that are not of quality, but all of that could be avoided. So I'll leave you with the following statement. Um, the younger you are, the more important it is. Irrespective of your long-term aspirations relationally, it's very important to start the conversation as early as possible. That process begins that should begin from your 20s, early 20s. You start thinking about, okay, what do you want? When do you want it? Who can provide it? What do those people who could provide it, what do they look like? Where would they be? What are their age ranges? What do they do for a profession? What do they want? Am I what they want? Can I become what they want? Learn how to pitch yourself. Learn how to handle rejection. When you find a relationship of your choice, 
and to your taste and liking. Learn the art of retention and then learn the art of success. Now I've set up a start or midway through today's session, four groups on married, married and divorced and widowed. I'm going to speak next about those four groups and, and I think you find some something of value there because um, we, we never prepare our loved ones for those four stages. I'm going to talk about that next. Now I hope this has been useful.